you very much, Professor Ravi, and uh, hello everyone here in this uh, very interesting course, which uh, when you described me, completely took my fancy and I thought this is exactly what institutions of technology need to, as a, as a rudder, as a guide to where uh, we go, otherwise we often are driven by technology for the sake of technology and land up in a big mess that we seem to be doing now. <coughs> so I'll uh, share a little bit of my story in Ladakh about uh, what I've been doing and yes, I share a um, part of uh, your life in that I studied engineering but I ended up doing I wouldn't say not engineering, but uh, much more than engineering, and using engineering where it was needed to solve uh, problems in life and to make people's lives more comfortable and so on. <coughs> so, just a little bit of my uh, youth and childhood, uh, how I ended up doing engineering in the first place. I had no idea of what to do uh, in life when my friends everywhere had clear idea of either becoming a doctor or an engineer and I didn't know why they wanted to or why I should choose any of these but I did like science very much and using science uh, to make life comfortable so Studying in uh, 11th grade, I remember, um, I took fancy to the chapter on, in physics on optics, light. Yeah? Um, and I was so interested. I got more and more interested in all these mirrors and lenses and I could imagine what could be done in a cold place like Ladakh with a concave mirror which could be focusing and then you could redirect it backwards through the focus and through the uh, dish itself into a little hole and thereby uh, getting light into indoors, underground and grow vegetables in very cold climate and so on. I could see many interesting applications of these, uh, playing with light, using mirrors and lenses. Uh, so much I got interested that I went asking around, I really want to study more about these. Where can I do that? I want to work on these, with these. How can I do that? Okay, maybe I should wait. There's a big... Uh, yeah, right. The input is more than I thought. <laughs> okay. uh, people who walked in, can you please settle down? You are already disturbing the lecture. Okay. Please settle down. Yeah, you've uh, not lost much uh, anyway. I was just telling you, uh, telling people about how I got into doing what I started doing, which I haven't told about. Um, so, while studying physics in 11th grade, I developed this uh, love for optics, light, lenses, mirrors, and uh, asked around how I could study more and do something in this field and. And an uncle of mine, who was an engineer himself, uh, said you could study more about this in mechanical engineering. So that day the decision was made that yes, I want to do engineering and because of this, and mechanical engineering is what I want to do. So I studied, prepared and one year later I was in the engineering college. And that year was peaceful, everybody studied, there were no segregation of branches, it was very good with lots of, uh, you know, actually humanities and rehashing of physics and all such things. But at the end of that first year, uh, it so happened that my father, who otherwise didn't take so much interest in what I was doing, happened to ask, so what are you doing uh, in engineering? And I said, uh, now I choose mechanical engineering. And he said, mechanical engineering? In Ladakh doesn't work, there's no scope, choose civil engineering. I was like shocked. How can I suddenly choose civil engineering? I'm in here only because I like my lenses and mirrors. Yeah? 
I said, no, no, I'm going to choose mechanical engineering. And he said, why? Because I like uh, these lenses and mirrors and I want to do something. Don't be ridiculous. There's no scope for such things in Ladakh. Choose civil engineering. He said, mechanical. Civil. Mechanical. Civil. Yeah? <laughs> and at the end of that uh, exchange, he said, if you do that, you'll do it at your own expense. Don't expect anything from me. That should have been a shock for me, but some voice inside me stood me up and said, thank you very much. And I left the house. Yeah? I left the house for many years uh, that day. But outside on the steps of the house, I was thinking, now what? Yeah? Three more years of engineering to go and expensive engineering to go. I didn't know what to do. I had taken that decision and said that and I was happy. But I had to do something. So I thought of how I can sustain and support my decision, my passion, in other words, my study. I wasn't uh, strong to do some, you know, laborers work or move bricks or anything, but then I thought, oh, I like um, teaching and I like science, maths. I could go <coughs> teach the students in Ladakh who I had seen had so much problems with the schooling system, they were high failure uh, because things were not adapted to a very peculiar place, climate, culture, language like that of Ladakh. So there was lots of problems students were facing. And on top of that, teachers, many teachers, not all, were exploiting that situation by doing tuition private tuitions at gunpoint, you know, you come, you pass, you know, don't come, you pay, type of tuitions. <laughs> Maybe some of you are familiar, hopefully that doesn't happen anymore. But that's what was happening and I thought maybe it's a good thing to do something about that also. So I went back that uh, winter vacation, we used to have long winter vacations, the whole college was going on an industrial tour and I chose to go back to Ladakh to do this, uh, teach and to basically earn my expense. And uh, I don't know what inside me was uh, bold or foolhardy. I went and thought of starting a coaching center which will teach many students at a time. And I put up posters about this. I was like 19. And I needed a venue, so I went to a hotel and said, um, I want to rent your hotel. Yeah? <laughs> I didn't have money for my next meal because I was kicked out of my house, so you can imagine. I didn't have any money. Next meal, I had to plan on relatives to go to so that I can go like I'm visiting and then have my meal there. <laughs> yeah? But then I took that uh, building on rent and the owner was somehow kind and clever because uh, it was winter so not a uh, season so he said yeah you can take and I made a deal then I arranged for some machines to print and I hired a stenographer put up posters and started this system and very interestingly it became very popular more and more students started coming uh, soon after I started teaching I had a problem of plenty. There are so many students that I didn't know whether I should stop or do what. But then I sort of invented a clever, uh, interesting technique that I still use and I think every institution should use unless they already use. And that was of encouraging peer learning among students. Eh? Encouraging peer learning. So what I would do, because I had many students, I didn't want the people not to have attention. Uh, because of the size, but I wanted not to say no to those who were like <coughs> insisting to come also. So what I did was in each subject, I didn't identify the stronger one than the weaker one. This is not to say that the stronger something great, they are weak in another subject. So the weak ones are good in yet another subject. So anyway, the stronger ones of each and the weaker ones of each, the in-between ones were okay. So I would do my class with all the, um, what would you call it, uh, animation that I could do. 
And then at the end of the class, I would take a special class for the stronger ones, the brighter ones in that subject uh, of, say, five or so. And to them, I would consolidate the understanding and train them to help the weaker ones, and teach the weaker ones. And then I would put them together for half an hour. So a class of, say, 40 minutes or so, 20 minutes of uh, grooming or mentoring to teach the weaker ones and exchange between the weaker and the stronger ones uh, for another 20 or 30 minutes. This started working wonders. You would imagine that the weaker ones got help. Yes, but the bigger output was not that the weaker ones became good. The bigger output was that the good ones became stars. Yeah? That was the biggest discovery that I uh, had. So the weak ones were helped by the brighter ones, so they became uh, very good. The bright ones, because they were teaching somebody, had to completely be clear in concept, in understanding, in grasp of everything. You know, often we think we understood when a professor gives a lecture. But there are wide gaping holes in our brain which do, do not connect and we think it's all done. But they appear when you have to explain to somebody else. And that's when you really learn. Some people say true learning happens only when you teach somebody else. You have really mastered only when you have taught somebody else. And that's what was happening. So the good ones became stars. And I became even better because I was teaching them. So it was a chain of learning, you know, weaker ones learning from the better ones, learning from me. And I was the biggest beneficiary of this, I would say. Everybody gained. And this, I think, is an amazing way of uh, making people like help each other, just giving the platform for this exchange to take place. So I advocate this everywhere that you know when you do good to others especially in this case you gain so much so every institute if there is such you know facilitated by the teacher or among your own you could start uh, peer learning groups and share between one another you don't have to feel bad to say I am weak in this because you're weak in this but you're strong in something else so it's always good to uh, recognize and um, do something about it than to be overpowered by this uh, ego and other things of not revealing I'm weak and I'm not understanding and so on. And it doesn't take a, a, a teacher, you know, there's one teacher for so many who may not have all the time to do this, but there are so many friends for each of us that we can always uh, learn from each other. So anyway, I won't go into this so much, but just to uh, pass by this thing that that peer learning thing was amazing and it started changing everything and the students were succeeding very well. In any case, they were so bright to grasp all the concepts. And therefore, okay, um, I have to uh, tell you about what happened to my mission. My mission was basically to earn my own expenses. So I taught for something like one and a half months of the winter. At the end of the one and a half months, two things happened that changed my life forever. Um, one thing, the first thing was that I came to earn for that year's expense of the engineering college. I earned not that year's expense, but I earned for all the three years cost in just those one and a half months, yeah? which would be uh, today's standard like uh, three or four lakhs in one and a half months I could earn in just that vacation. So that was a life-changing experience. Not in that I earned big money, but in that I went through this realization that money could be made any time you want to. You know, In one and a half months you can earn enough for the whole course. That was not the biggest thing. There, there are more interesting things to do, therefore earn when you need to, but then do something about issues like these students. The second thing was that these students were so bright. They could understand every 
concept when I explain them in my own language and in a very lively way, they could understand everything. It was nothing wrong with them. It was the system that was failing them. So yeah, that was a time when in Ladakh, 95% of the students used to fail every year, uh, consistently, every year, only 5% would pass. And that brought me face to face with this situation and I started analyzing why this was happening. Are they really so bad, the students, or so like retarded or what? And I found there was nothing wrong with them and there was almost everything wrong with the system. It was a system that was just transplanted from, I would say, Kashmir in the case of Ladakh. But Kashmir got it transplanted from uh, Delhi and Delhi got it transplanted from London. And by the time that copy of the copy of the copy reaches Ladakh, it makes no sense at all. So you have a system, just to give an example, where A for apple, B for ball, C for cat, fine, but then it comes to F for fan, yeah? F for fan in a minus 30 region doesn't make F any simpler. If you think of it, if you think of it, these A for apple and B for ball were invented by some clever person who thought these letters are such abstract squiggles that nobody would be find it easy to remember. So why don't we make it a little bit alive? So A is a code that adults have made up, grown-ups have made up among themselves. It's nothing natural. Yeah? So this squiggle A, to make it easier to remember by association, they thought of the child's favorite food, something favorite, something close to their life. So apple is great for A or A, ball. What better than for a child? A ball, a cat, great. But then somebody just copied it, copied it, copied it, and it comes to Ladakh with F for fan. It doesn't make the squiggle any simpler with an example which is even more complex, right? So children don't understand F for fan, but what is this? And the teacher goes, um, you don't know this? No? I also don't know this. <laughs> because they have never seen a van in such a cool place. It goes on to T for train at 11,000 meters, right? 11,000 feet trains, you know. But it made sense in London where the designer of the system thought Papa comes by train and goes by train, therefore a child can relate to train. As could relate to ship because it's a coastal country. But the same thing is taken up there in Ladakh and S for ship, S for, S for ship. You memorize without even any benefits for your next life. If it was a mantra, you perhaps have some hope of some other life you would benefit. But S for ship and T for train 100 times doesn't have any benefit. It only confuses. So you can see how the system, when blindly applied, makes no sense and breaks the children and is totally out of context. So, finally, when they fail, they are blamed for that also. The children are blamed for being dumb and mediocre and so on. To the extent that teachers who would come from, you know, outside Ladakh in those days, wouldn't see what was wrong, like language was a huge problem. The children in Ladakh only speak Ladakhi and suddenly they are made to learn books in Urdu or in English, yeah, like these. <coughs> and then when they wouldn't understand, rather than introspecting or reflecting, they would just um, devise what I call pseudo-scientific reasons like there is less oxygen in the air, so these skills will never do well. Yeah? Shortage of oxygen. And I was thinking, yeah, I can see who is suffering from that. <laughs> 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 So um, this is how bad it was and therefore the second realization that I got in that winter was yes, lenses and mirrors are my first love, yeah? my passion, that's why I came. But perhaps this world needs a change in the education system 
then adding another engineer to the crowd. Huh? So I started thinking of bringing reforms in education because that's what was keeping hundreds of such bright young people chained because of a faulty system. And how could I just go my own way, you know, leaving those people chained when I know where the chain opens and where to break the chain. So I changed my course. I thought of, okay, I'll study my engineering, but I'll first bring reforms in the system. Yeah? I went through a uh, deep realization that year that in life, in life, it's not only about what I need. Yeah? What I need is what I had been looking for, most of us look for. But what is also important, and even more maybe, is what needs me. And what needs me was the education system. And what I need was my lenses and mirrors and lights and solar lighting and so on. So I kept it on. I studied. I took my options in renewable energies and so on. But my mind was already into bringing changes in the education system because there was such high failure in the system. So I finished my engineering, but then I was already connecting with other like-minded young people to bring reforms in the education system. And as soon as I finished, the same year, we started uh, this organization called Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh yeah, to bring reforms in the education system. So we started uh, with again, coaching, teaching people, uh, students, to take their exams better because they were failing. And one year, two year, we did that, and the results were very good. But then we started thinking, that's, uh, wait a minute. If we keep repairing broken products of a system, which continues to produce broken products, it could be 50 years, and we would be still repairing broken things and feeling very charitable and very good about that. You know? Feel good factor would be very high, but we'll be only repairing broken products of a system which, to begin with, need not be producing broken products. So we start rethinking, started rethinking should we do this charity or should we go and change it at the source so that people don't fail in the first place? And if they don't fail, in 10 years they may not fail, they won't come and like beg you to help and feel so grateful and you feel charitable and all that. No, if you change the system so that products are not broken in the first place, then in 10 years, people may not even know who did it. You won't have that same, uh, you know, charitable gratitude exchange and all that, but they will have no problems. So, therefore, we thought, we started saying that our aim should be, this organization's aim should be to eliminate its own need. It should eliminate the need for such a charity so that in 10 or 20 years, people don't even know that they would have or should be having a problem and somebody has been kind to help them. And therefore, we thought of changing the system at the roots. And the roots, where they start, was, was the village schools, the primary schools in the villages. If they become good, then students have a very, um, positive experience and learn and of course they won't fail in those numbers uh, later. So therefore we then started changing our course to work with the government, work with the government and bring change in the primary schools in rural areas. Rural areas and government schools because we believe that's where India lives, right? In rural areas and in government schools is where the children are. In you have some private schools in the cities, but they are very different. The real India is in villages and in government schools. And a country cannot make real progress by just the few private schools you hear about. It's 
it's only when all these schools in the villages of India become really good, that's when India will perform. You cannot expect to compete with the other nations or be equal to them with a system where I really think few schools, maybe 3% or 4% are better than American schools, but 96-7% are worse than Sub-Saharan Africa. <coughs> That's a situation we have in India now. If you go into interior rural schools, that's not how India can expect uh, happiness or peace or harmony. That's a recipe for uh, unrest. That's a recipe for social chaos, disaster, you know, uh, all kinds of violence and so on. I always tell people who, who are like haves, who, are, who can afford to, to look at not just their children in their big private schools, but also care about the children in the rural government schools. Not only the, out, of, out of altruism and out of like goodness, but also it's in your interest. You may have your children in the best schools, but tomorrow if there's such disparity in the system, then they will not be safe, you know. They may have a huge house, but you will have to keep guards everywhere to protect them from people who were, whose childhoods were, you know, destroyed by a very bad system who then come out and perhaps uh, become a nightmare for your children also. So you have a responsibility, both moral and personal selfish also, to make the system good in the villages. So that's how we started then working with the village schools and it was a big campaign uh, together with young people like um, 11th grade, 12th grade, they were associating with Sekmol to make people aware about this need for change because in a democracy things change only when people feel the need for change. Yeah? Lasting change happens when at the grassroots, at the people's level the programming changes. I mean, of course you can, and many people do, go to the secretary of education or the minister for education and say, sir, can you please change this? This is what is wrong. And if they are kind, they may even agree with you and take some steps. But the next government comes and wipes it all out. There is nothing. Because it was not people's agenda. It was just your agenda and the leader, you know, uh, was kind. Therefore, we didn't want this shortcut method. So we went into every village in Ladakh, none left, yeah? even seven days trek or whatever, to change people's programming from their priority of like roads, rice and uh, subsidies to education, education, education. Yeah? Only education. So we did lots of campaigns, training for village leaders and so on to demand something that leaders find hard to give. If it is rice and roads, it's not from their pockets they're giving, they can do anything. But if you demand quality education, then it's not just about money, it's about making sure that a system works. And that's when you, you're using, making use of your leaders to do something. Otherwise, it's very easy for them to just give a generator or a road or something. So, the whole of Ladakh um, changed its priority and it was visible everywhere. Anywhere a politician would go, people would demand education. education. So, education became the priority of Ladakh and it has remained so for many. Uh, that was <laughs> keeping them, you know, uh, failing in the system. So, that was good, that was great that rural schools started changing and becoming better, but then there was still some failure, whether, you know, 25% or 1%, I believe nobody should feel like failure. And in any case, I keep saying that 25% may sound smaller than 95%, which it was just a few years before that. In statistics, yes, 25% sounds smaller, but otherwise, even 1% is very big if that included you, right? 
Otherwise, it's just a statistic. So how should we make people fail, even if it is 1%? So we should give them also a chance. And in any case, in a failing system, failures are not failures. It's other reasons that make them fail. So why don't we, if they don't learn the way we teach, why don't we teach the way they learn? It's a system where everything is all in paper, all in talk, lectures and so on. And of course, not everybody is good for talks and lectures. Real people are more about real three-dimensional world. Only few are so <laughs> odd. Uh, to me, in an odd education system, those who are good are very odd people. Yeah? Those who are normal would need a normal system. And normal is not what happens in a classroom. It's really abnormal. I, if you think of it, I find it a totally abnormal system that has come into picture maybe in the 300 years of industrialization that we make people sit and only listen and write and things are all about paper, paper knowledge, paper exams, paper degrees, nothing real. Whereas human beings are made for the real world. 300 years of industrial revolution may be necessitated, necessitated such classrooms and such schools, but 6 million years of human evolution on this planet was very different. It wasn't like this. That's why I say that if our young people are not doing well in schools, it's not because they are bad. They are too good for this poor system that they are not doing well. Because my understanding, my theory is, I don't know, maybe some research could be done. My theory is that over millions of years of evolution, nature designed all the species to adapt to the context, to the environment. All animals, including human beings. And nature designed in this wild world that we lived in until a few hundred years ago, Nature designed the young ones of the species, of the human species, to be very energetic, to be very real, engaged, physical, you know, ch taking challenges in wild nature. So it has packed our young people with lots of energy, especially young people with lots of energy. And in the past it used to be absorbed, that energy used to be absorbed because life was so challenging, so challenging physically challenging in wild nature. But then in the last 300 years, life became so simple. We outsourced all the need for physical engagement to fossil fuels. Eh? Outsourced it. No energy is needed from us. You can use like 3 million years old energy and just press buttons here and there. But nature didn't design us for that. It had designed us for tackling all energy, taking loads and you know, taking on wild animals or whatever. And such young people that are designed by nature for such a life are suddenly put in a classroom for six hours to listen to lectures and write. Of course, it comes out in very strange ways, these energies. And that's what I think is called teenager problems. Teenagers are notorious world over, they are this, they are that, they are that. But you know what? In the interiors of Ladakh, in the villages of Ladakh, I have never seen anything called teenager problem. Because they are always engaged in taking on real challenges in life. So there is no such situation where everything is all done for them. You just have to press a button or your mother brings it all on a platter. So you have nothing else to do than that energy which nature packed in you has to go somewhere. And you throw that letter away and fight with your mother and your father and his system and that's what brings this name to teenagers is what my theory is. And I see some analogies also. I'm not just saying for nothing. I was thinking once, you have seen rodents, rats, mice, right? Have you? You have? Yeah. So what do you see? You see that they are chewing and making holes in all the cupboards and boxes and things. Do you see that here also? We see, yeah? And I was wondering, what's happening? Are they eating wood or bricks or what? No, it turns out they don't. 
It turns out that they have to keep chewing on something hard. Otherwise, nature has been so, you know, um, interesting in design. This is a lesson in design um, for engineers, which we may never parallel. But rodents were designed to eat hard food from the jungles, forests, whatever, and food is so hard that their teeth would wear out. Yeah? And nature, through evolution, designed that their teeth should grow at the same rate as it wears out eating. So it's considered around 2.8 millimeters per week. It grows, it keeps growing, which means four inches in a year. Yeah, four inches in a year. Now, if a colony of mice or rats who were happily eating hard food and at the same rate their teeth were um, bearing out, suddenly strike a whole treasure of butter, for example. Imagine, imagine. They would think, that's the best thing to happen. Now, no worries about food. We have a huge mine of butter. But they would perhaps all be dead within a year. With teeth four inches this way and four inches this way. Right? No? That's how evolution designed them for the rough foods, not for butter. And therefore, I think we humans struck that butter some 300 years ago where everything was all outsourced to coal and oil and gas and so on and all we do is press some buttons and the grown-ups are all dying of diabetes, heart attack and so on <laughs> and the young ones are all hard to you know, control because that energy has to come out you can't have release energy by pressing a button <laughs> so that's where I, I think uh, the problem lies so therefore if an education system really engages young people into solving problems, into dealing with realities, then it would really capture their imagination and their energies and that would be the best way to learn. So, so for those who were failing, the 25%, we started a special school. As I said, if we don't learn the way you teach, then teach us the way we learn. So there we started teaching things in a very different way, engaged, practical, hands-on, and this was not a government school, so we could do what we like. In the government schools that we brought reforms, there were limitations, you know, you could change this, but not that, and this, and not that. So we did a lot of that, trained all the teachers, changed all the textbooks, which, you know, these uh, F for fan things. So we changed all primary school books to make uh, sense to children in Ladakh, organized all the villagers, and therefore all the results started changing. But for the failures, more had to be done. So we uh, set up this school that was only for them. And therefore this school, I will have a short film about this and our next project uh, very soon. But this school is very different in that the admission criteria unlike the IIT, is failure. Yeah. <laughs> there are only those who have failed get admission. And those who have passed are in waiting list. And those who have talked, very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Among the failures also, we are very choosy. If somebody is very bright, we really analyze. If they are bright, that's okay, no, no crime. But if they have that fire to do something better, then we take them. If they are bright because their parents wrote on them and made them something, and they don't have that fire, then we don't go for that. Yeah? So one who wants to change things, we try to give uh, maximum chances. So the admission criteria and the interviews are all upside down. We look for those who have done very badly, but want to do something in life. Yeah? And uh, then, then they are helped to learn in different ways. For example, as I said, they want challenges, they want to do things. It's not that they don't want it. The problem is they want more and you don't have things that can satisfy them. That's when uh, young people's problems arise. So these people run the school themselves. So we design the school itself. It's a very uh, far off school, away from all the city and things. So we, in the, in the 
middle of a desert. We treat it like a little country and make the students run it like a little country with a little government that they elect every two months and they assign, the elected leader assigns roles to each of the students and these roles are real, they are not just mock classroom things. They take care of all the cows, milk all the cows at 5.30 in the morning you know, and at 6 in the evening for the whole campus. They grow vegetables, they uh, take care of the accounts, they take care of the solar um, power plant and repair it when it breaks down, they take care of the water supply system, they take care of all the dignitaries and guests who visit there, they run a travel company that uh, exchanges students from all over the world, from Korea, Denmark, London and so on, who visit there and they charge them and they make income for the whole school, they produce like jam um, and other products on the campus. So they actually take charge of things and run things and that's how the, thing, the system uh, runs. Every two months there's a new government form and they are uh, planning uh, the, the setting goals for the next two months and then they execute during the two months and then they report, make presentations for the parliament, the new uh, parliament. And that's how they learn life skills of real life, through life rather than through textbooks. So um, whether it is science or other things are related to real concepts. Huh? So when I said they make jam, we would try and relate it to germ theory. Germ theory tortures you in exams, but actually it can be useful. Huh? It can be useful in preserving fruits that last only one week to last one year if you know what happens with bacteria and or, uh, all these organisms. So they apply it and make hundreds of bottles of jam, which then can be sold. And when they sell, it doesn't sell simply. They have to plan how to sell, how to market, how to label. And that's when they learn economics. And they get a huge lot of profit also. And they spend it on a tour, for example, going down the Himalayas to Himachal Pradesh and other things to learn geography on the way. So handling real things, uh, even failures, become stars. And now I play this from here. Yeah? So just a glimpse of this uh, school. And now we are working on scaling it up to university level because universities also need change. It cannot remain just theoretical. Again, paper, paper, paper. So uh, this comes, this film takes you from the school experience to our future uh, dream of creating an alternative university which addresses the problem of, you know, universities where, again, even uh, more mature young people are bustling with energy but are solving case studies, you know, made up problems, whereas the world is full of real problems. So could we be solving real issues and challenging the young people and you know, by doing things and doing is the best way of learning. So we'll see this and then we'll discuss more. <laughs> schooling interfere with my education. So said Mark Twain. How about you? Do you miss your school or college days? You perhaps do. But perhaps not for the classrooms and teaching. You actually perhaps wished every day that the school be closed the next day so you could stay home. But here's a school in Lada where the most dreaded punishment is to be sent home for two weeks, where students learn by doing things, where they engage in various innovations to solve real-life problems like climate change, where they run the school themselves like a little country with an elected government and learn management and governance that way, where they learn communication by running the campus newspaper and radio, Science by designing and building their own school, solar heated mud buildings that stay at plus 15 even in minus 15 winters. Kindness and compassion through introspection and meditation. 
a school where the criteria of admission is not your percentage, but that the conventional system has failed you. Hi, I'm Sonam Wangchuk from Ladakh, a remote mountain region in the Indian Himalayas. 25 years ago, when I was finishing my own engineering education, I saw that schools were a pain for everyone. But for mountain children, it was doubly painful and irrelevant. Children who spoke Ladakhi or Tibetan at home were made to sit all day memorizing in alien languages like Urdu or English. F for van, S for ship, T for train. Till recently, every year, 95% of the students used to fail in the all-important 10th grade exams. Together with like-minded friends, we launched SECMOL, the Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh, and said enough is enough. Working with the government, we rewrote many textbooks, retrained the teachers, and organized the villagers. And the results started changing too. For those who still failed, we started the alternative school that you just saw. And the results? Dewan Rixen went on to become a top journalist and later became the education minister of Ladakh Hill Council at 27. He had failed his 10th grade five times. Stanzin became a filmmaker and has been winning awards across countries. He had failed four times. Miss Timless is today a celebrated social entrepreneur. She had failed three times. But now we see that the state of higher education is no better. Not only for Ladakhis, who of course are doubly disadvantaged again, but for you in the big cities too. It's time we change this. We in Ladakh are dreaming again. This time our dream is to create an alternative university that will use all our learnings from the past 25 years. Once again, a hands-on doers university where the school of business runs real-life companies on campus. The school of tourism runs high-end hotels and simple homestays. The school of education runs innovative schools. The revenues from these sustain the university while the students get free higher education and of course hands-on experience. But this is more than a dream now. His Holiness Chetan Rinpoche, one of the top spiritual leaders in Tibetan Buddhism after His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is supporting this cause as the chief patron. The Hill Council Government of Ladakh has earmarked roughly 200 acres of land and the ice stupa artificial glaciers have already started greening this desert. A fully solar heated mud built university township is being planned by some of India's top architects. Together, let's start the next learning revolution where education is not limited to just the three R's all too much to do with the head alone where skills of the hands and kindness of the heart are given equal importance. Sure, it would take significant financial resources to materialize this ambitious dream. Recently, I was awarded the prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise for the Ice Super Artificial Glaciers. Sona Wanshu. I contribute my Rolex Award as a seed for this cause. Thank you very much. I have decided to contribute the roughly 1 crore rupees as a seed fund to finally raise 150 crore rupees for the first phase of the project. And I very much hope that you all will join me and match this contribution according to your capacities. Together, we can change the face of higher education forever. Not just for Ladakh, but for the whole world. So join us. The future has already begun.